Good afternoon, everyone. I want to call to order this afternoon's meeting of the Senate Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. And uh, Madam Secretary, um, please note we do have a quorum present. Please mark uh, Senator Severs Gansert and Senator Canazaro present when they arrive. Uh, to the public to, here in Carson City, down at the Sawyer Building, and listening on the internet, we're getting very close to the sine die adjournment. So there are a lot of committees meeting and assembly and floor session, so things are very fluid. So we are uh, starting now and hoping to be able to have all our bill hearings. We may have to have some recesses and come back in, in terms of having presenters available. But uh, with that, we'll just be at ease and uh, wait for just a couple of minutes to see if any of our presenters are available or co-presenters. Thank you everybody for your understanding.
I want to thank everyone for their patience. Uh, the assembly is on the floor right now. However, I have checked with some of our assembly colleagues and uh, Assemblyman Torres has told me that um, it's fine for me to have one of her co-presenters actually present Assembly Bill 246. And we have a co-presenter down in Southern Nevada. So if you are available to come and present Assembly Bill 246 down at the Sawyer Building, you would just come forward, state your name for the record, and uh, tell us a little bit about the bill. With that, we'll open the hearing on Assembly Bill 246. And thank you for being there and for pinch hitting during this late, late time in the end of session. Thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Chair Orange Shaw. I just want to confirm that everyone can hear me right now. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much Thank for being here to present Assembly Bill 246. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, um, Chair Orange Shaw and committee members. Um, for the record, my name is Mary Jana Ramos, M A R Y J A N E T R A M O S, and I am the campaign manager for All Voting Local Action. And although Assemblywoman Torres is currently not here due to her responsibilities, I would like to recognize her leadership in sponsoring AB 246, which is the bill being considered today by this committee. Um, I would like to provide some background on this bill. And this bill has been the result of almost of two years of work. So our organization, All Voting is Local Action, um, actually surveyed um, counties, the 17 counties across the state in the summer of 2021 in order to understand language accessibility for voters in the state, which was also followed by a listening session. We got responses. Um, and we got responses and, and, and just to provide also more background of what questions were included in the survey was whether or not a county offered voter registration materials, election materials, and signage at voting sites um, in another language besides English. We had the opportunity to learn from a few county clerks that they would require approval from their commission if they tried to provide materials in another language. Um, we also learned that while they understood the issue of the need for voting materials in another language, a state mandate and funding would be needed to implement such efforts. Um, so as a result of this, we learned um, out of the 17 counties that only three counties offered voting materials and assistance in another language besides English. AB 246 um, was inspired by the need to be inclusive of our diverse communities across the state, but initial policy suggestions were also inspired by the conversations we have with the clerks and registrars. Stakeholders such as the Secretary of State, County Clerks and Registrar's Office have been involved in this bill to ensure that we can create a sustainable and equitable framework to expand language access at the local and state level in a way that is effective, operational, and fiscally responsible. So with this being said, I would like to provide an, um, just context of Section 203 and how that relates to our state. So um, Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, the VRA, requires that a state or a local jurisdiction, such as the county, city, our municipality, um, they need to pro provide voting materials to the following communities, Native American, Asian American, Alaska Native, and Hispanic. Um, in order to qualify for a federal mandate, one, the, one of the, prote um, the protected groups must meet a threshold of 10,000 citizens, or make up 5% of the voting age, speak the same language, be limited in English profession, and have an illiteracy rate higher than the national average. Um, I would also like to add that language determinations are made every five years by the U.S. Department of Justice using U.S. Census data with the next one taking place in 2026. Um, in Nevada, only two counties, Clark and Nye, are required to comply with Section 203 of the VRA. Clark County is required to provide um, voting materials and assistance in Spanish and Tagalog. Um, Nye County is required to provide interpretation and Shoshone given that it is not a written language. And Washoe County is the only jurisdiction that voluntarily provides bilingual ballots and voting information and Spanish. Um, so with that being said, we know Section 203 is the foundation of 
what language accessibility um, looks like when it comes to citizens participating in the election process. But the criteria um, are difficult given that there are limitations, such as a population threshold, single language requirements, literacy requirements, and the limitation to only for protected communities. Um, we all know that Nevada is a very diverse state. We rank third. We have the fourth largest population of residents who identify as Asian and Pacific Islander, and the fifth largest population who identify as Hispanic. When we compare this data to 2010, um, we have seen a significantly increase over the over this decade with the API community growing at 45.6 and the Hispanic community growing at 24.3. Um, and then some um, some data that I would like to highlight is that we all know that 30% of the population um, in Nevada speak another language at home um, besides English and that close to 500,000 Nevadans who are over the age of 18 have reported to speak a language other than English. So. Um, just to summarize why we are we're, we, we are urging this committee to consider AB 246 is number one, we recognize that our state is being diverse. We're passing, by passing this bill, we are encouraging civic, civic participation from citizens who have historically been disenfranchised from the ballot box. And it's an opportunity as a state to go beyond the federal guidelines and develop a policy to help voters who don't speak English as their first language. Um, the outcome of any election, whether it's state, local, or federal, directly impacts the lives of every Nevadan, regardless of the language that they speak. Um, therefore, voters whose primary language is in English should be supported and provided with the necessary translated voting information and election materials to safely and securely be able to cast a ballot. Um, lastly, I would like to add that dismantling language-related barriers to the ballot box is a nonpartisan issue. And this um, summarizes my presentation and thank you so much for your time and if there are any questions I will be more than happy to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you very much Ms. Ramos. Thank you again for pinch hitting for our assembly colleagues who are on the floor right now and appreciate your work on this bill. Uh, members are there any questions for Ms. Ramos? So, Senator Daly. Thank you for the presentation. Just a couple questions for clarification. Want to make sure that uh, that I understand. So are we, this is going to be in addition to the federal requirement. I think you said in uh, 52 CFR. <clears throat> so we're expanding on that. Uh, and then is it? Well, I know we can put stuff on the website. That's fairly easy to do and shouldn't be any barriers. But. Um, does each county have to meet this or do they have to meet the population requirement before they have to do it? To, what, what, are, what exactly are we anticipating here? I don't know if the Secretary of State has answers to that or not, but I'm just trying to make sure how far this goes past what the federal requirements are. Mary Janet, um, for the record. So um, what this bill is hoping to accomplish is two things. There, there is a population threshold that counties must, must meet. And for right now, the, the county requirement is set at 5,000. And then there is a separate um, requirement or benchmark of 20,000. So um, for the 5,000, that essentially means that this that the county will, require, will be required to provide voting information, um, such as sample ballots, ballots in that specific language. Um, so it does go beyond federal guidelines currently set at 10,000. If this legislation is enacted, we would be able to add Mandarin for Clark County. Um, Although Washoe County is already compliant voluntarily, this would pretty much essentially put in statute that now they're required to continue to provide um, those materials that they are currently providing. The 20,000, um, which is a statewide which is a statewide benchmark, which will allow for statewide ballots in a specific language. In this case, it would be Spanish. Um, the Secretary of State, as Brian and statute, would have to be working collaboratively closely with clerks to notify them exactly how that process would look like. Um, but other things that I would also like to add, right, that 
the expectation is that, number one, we will be establishing a statewide toll-free telephone number for Nevadans to receive translation assistance, as currently written, the bill would allow for Spanish, Tagalog, Shoshone, and Mandarin to be the four languages provided by the Secretary of State. Um, of course, other languages as, as communities are mean that population threshold would be added. Um, but so far, uh, in regards to going beyond federal guidelines, um, yes, because we are, we, number one, we're um, just for redundancy purposes, we are lowering that threshold, but we, are, we could also in the future add more communities that are currently not protected. Um, and I think the perfect example is it would be the Ethiopian community. We have a growing and thriving Ethiopian community here in Clark County. They're currently not a protected community under Section 203. So if they were to meet that population threshold, we could see Amharic um, in the future um, in regards to being offered voting materials in their native language. Thank you very much. Any follow-up, Senator Daly? Please go ahead. All right, so I was trying to, to follow that the best I could. So how do they do it now where we have the requirement you have to send the ballot out in uh, a different language or the election materials? Uh, all I know is the one I get, right? And it's in English. I don't speak another language, so English is good. So how do they know who to send different ballots to, or do they have to now send out potentially, you know, the same ballot 20 times to in different languages in case you speak it. I'm just trying to figure out the logistics of it and how that gets. I'm not, we want to try to accommodate. We want to try to make sure people can vote. We want to make sure that they have the information they need. I'm not arguing with any of that. I'm just trying to figure out how it exactly works. I knew I'd Thank get you Thank you, Senator Daly, for the, for, for, the, for the, no, no, it's okay for the question. Um, so I can only speak specifically to two counties, but um, so I want to speak more specifically to Clark County because um, voters are given the opportunity at the time that they register to vote to report their language of preference. Um, so the voter could either select Spanish or Tagalog, and then once that voter registration form gets to the hands of the election administrators, then they will be sent automatically that information. If the voter does not uh, report their language of preference, then they would they have the opportunity to call the um, the registrar's office and request those materials in their given language. In the case of Washoe County, they already do it automatically bilingual, so no necessary steps are needed from a voter who speaks Spanish. But I, I will add. I, I will add that we will rely on the expertise of those who have done it and, of course, on the registrars um, and the clerks who will essentially be the ones overseeing the implementation, as well as um, the Secretary of State who will be providing guidance on how to effectively implement this bill. And I do see Mr. Walosh in there, so if you would like to step in, um, please do so. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramos and Deputy Secretary of State Walosh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, would, would you be able to comment on Senator Daly's question? We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Absolutely, Chair. Uh, Mark Velashen, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections for the Record, uh, to you, Senator Daly, through the Chair. Um, uh, just to add on to what Mary Janet uh, commented on, uh, the other county, Nye County, they do arrange for an interpreter to be at the uh, the ballot, again, speak, recognizing that Shoshone is a, uh, a spoken and not written language. Uh, but really, the, the other behind-the-scenes logistics piece of this, uh, in order to, one, identify the number of personnel who have uh, this requirement, we are going to uh, update the voter registration form uh, specifically to identify the languages that, that individuals uh, have a preference for. Uh, that will inform our future decisions in recognition of how many you know, personnel, individuals in the county uh, there are uh, to see if it, it reaches that threshold or not. Uh, when the ballots themselves are developed, uh, again, step one is to make sure that it's in the proper statutorily required order uh, of offices, alphabetical, and there's other requirements as well. Once it's in English, uh, then there are steps made at the county levels currently in Clark and Washoe to translate that information. Uh, and then there's a proofreading process as well to make sure that uh, once it is translated into Tagalog, into, uh, in, into Spanish, uh, that, that again, the information is accurate and in the same order as well. So there is a, a little bit of an additional time requirement, uh, but we view it, again, the, whole, the holistic process from informing the decisions uh, based on the number of individuals who need these uh, translated documents uh, through to the translation of the, the ballots themselves and, and then a proofreading process to make sure that we meet the rest of the statutory timelines. Does that answer your question? Any follow-up, Senator Daly? And thank you. Please go direct to the member. Thank you, Deputy Secretary of State. I think so. I just you guys have a process on how you do it, so people when they register can mark down a preference. 
they can call and ask for the preference. In other words, you don't have to read people's minds. Something has to happen on the other end, uh, and then you can make the adjustments to accommodate and various things. And then if they get there and can't read it, you try to have somebody there to help them or give them a phone number to call. Is Got Thank you for the question, Senator Mark Veloz, for the record. Yes, that, that is exactly correct. Uh, there is definitely a back and forth with a, a level of redundancy so that if they don't notify us up front, there are opportunities for them to get these uh, specialized ballots later. Thank you very much, Deputy Walsh. And any further questions either from Ms. Ramos or Deputy Walsh? Senator Krasner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Walsh. Um, do you know how many languages uh, this will be prepared in. Thank you for the question, Senator Mark Velasco, for the record. Uh, the way the bill, and Mary Janet, please correct me if I misspeak here, uh, the intent would be Spanish uh, statewide, with I believe the exception of one county. Um, and then I recall, I mean, I may uh, phone a friend here real quick with Mary Janet, see if she has the other details. Yes. So um, in regards to the Spanish Seedway toll-free telephone number, as, as it is currently written, um, the state would be offering Spanish, Mandarin, and Tagalog. Shoshone, it's a very unique um, language, so that would is just available to those um, who live in that particular county. Um, but yes, you are correct. In regards to um, specific counties, um, Clark County would be mandated to um, comply with Mandarin um, voting materials and sample ballots, and that is essential. And that, besides Spanish statewide, there would be no other effects in regards to adding more languages. But we are hoping that in the future, more languages could be added. I have one more question. Thank you, Ms. Ramos. Um, Follow up from Senator Krasner. So I, and I apologize if you if you uh, if this is already gone over. But what is the criteria for um, presenting this in a different language? Is it if there's a thousand people that speak that language, 153, because, I mean, an argument could be said, well, you know, there's three people that speak Farsi or French or Italian or, you know, whatever. Um, they deserve to be able to read these in their language as well. So I'm just wondering what the criteria is. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for the question, Mark Velosh, for the record. So the, the current federal requirement is 10,000 individuals per county, um, and, and this bill would reduce that threshold to approximately 5,000 per county or a statewide number of 25,000. Thank you. Thank you, and I see Chief Deputy Secretary of State here to um, so I, also any jump in. Any thank you. We are get to lucky get to have you both here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Orenshaw, uh, Senator Krasner, Gabriel DeCara, for the record, Chief Deputy Secretary of State. And apologies, Mary Jan, and I bet I'm cutting you off, but uh, it, it is uh, specifically individuals with a limited English proficiency. So it's not just to speak the language. Um, they must also, by the, the census definition, uh, there, there must be a, that number of individuals with a limited English proficiency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Severs Cancer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just kind of going back to, um, and so you've got the definition of limited English proficiency means unable to speak or understand English adequately participate in the electoral process, which is subjective, um, but I think helpful because we want to make sure people can vote. So my question is more about like data because it says basically if, if you t let um, the registrar voters know once that you want it in a different language, then you automatically continue that process. Um, and so I guess it, carrying that data and then I don't know if there should be a check on that like every five years or something or else you're, you're continue to print things as we evolve because we're going to have different languages for folks. And then some people will probably reach English proficiency. So just sort of a question on how you're going to manage who you keep in that category. Thank you for the question, Senator Mark Velasco, for the record. Uh, it's an excellent consideration uh, and, and one that I think warrants further discussion um, as the implementation continues into future election cycles. Um, there are other uh, provisions across Title 24 that have similar requirements where we identify something and then there's a, a check-in process, so to speak. Um, so I, I think your, your point is well taken. I, I, I won't uh, make up an answer on the spot now. We don't have one, frankly, but I think it's an excellent catch and certainly something we'll keep a close eye on. Uh, because if at the end of the day, you're right, if, if there's a requirement um, that, that no longer over the next decade or two uh, is still in place, uh, then it's certainly worthy of re-examining. 
Thank you very much. Any follow-up, Senator Sievers Cancer? No. Any additional questions, either from Ms. Ramos or our Deputy Secretary of State for Elections, Mark Walashen? I'm not seeing any additional questions. Thank you very much uh, for being here, Deputy Secretary of State. Thank you, Ms. Ramos, for uh, helping us here while our Assembly colleagues are on the floor. With that, I'd like to go to support for Assembly Bill 246. I'd like to start here in Carson City, then I'll go down to the Sawyer Building, then we'll go to the phone lines. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We are here today in strong support of AB 246. Translated voting rights materials ensure that individuals who speak languages other than the official languages of a country can fully understand the voting processes and exercise their democratic rights. It promotes inclusivity and helps overcome language barriers, allowing a more diverse range of people to participate in the electoral process. If individuals don't have access to translated voting materials, they may rely on secondhand information, which could be inaccurate or biased. By providing official translations, governments can ensure that accurate information about voting procedures, deadlines, and requirements is available to all citizens. This reduces the risk of confusion or misinformation that could lead to voter disenfranchisement and other electoral issues. Please support AB 246. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Whoever would like to go next, state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Cassie Charles, and I'm the Campaign Director at Plant the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in support of AB246. At Plan, we believe everybody's voice is valuable and that our democracy is most vibrant um, when as many people are participating as possible. Language access promotes civic engagement and inclusion. It sends a message to our community members whose primary language is not English that they are valued members of the electorate. This, in turn, can help us build trust in the political process, increase voter turnout um, among unrepresented groups. In a democracy, every vote should be heard and all barriers to voting should be removed. A voter's limited English proficiency should not restrict their right to vote. By supporting AB 246, you will demonstrate your commitment to holding fair and accessible elections that reflect the diversity of our state. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, um, Chairman or Michelle and committee members for the record. My name is Emily Prasad Zamora, P-E-R-S-A-U-D hyphen Z-A-M-O-R-E. I'm the Executive Director of Silver State Voices that leads the Latin Nevadans Vote Coalition. And on behalf of the coalition today, we are in strong support of AB 246. We work on democracy issues year round. Uh, whether it's voter registration, voter education, or election protection, we consistently strive to ensure that all individuals have equal access to participate in the democratic process. Unfortunately, in every single election season, without fail, we receive questions about language access and voting. We've been asked to help find an interpreter for Mandarin-speaking voters at a polling place during early vote. Additionally, whenever we come across election materials, the first question asked is if the materials have been translated into Spanish. This highlights the ongoing importance of language access in our work. Language access is always at the top of our minds when educating voters and encouraging them to cast their ballots. AB 246 would address the language needs of Nevada's voters by establishing policy changes throughout the state. I urge this committee to support AB 246. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Anyone else in support here in Carson City? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone down at the Sawyer Building in support of the measure. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Hello, Chair and Committee members. Thank you so much. My name is Amy Koo, A-M-Y-K-O-O, -O, and I'm the Acting Deputy Director of One APIA Nevada, testifying in support of AB 246. We advocate for the growing AANHPI community here in Nevada. AANHPI voters account for one in 10 voters in Nevada. Nevada is also one of 16 states where more Asian and um, Pacific Islander voters cast ballots in 2022 than 2018. There will be a community letter in your inboxes later today talking about the impact that this bill will have on our community members uh, signed by various community organizations in the state that have AANHPI members. 
In 2020, Clark County missed the VRA threshold by less than 500 people for Chinese speakers. That means that 9,556 9, LEP Chinese speakers were identified in Nevada, and we needed 10,000 to provide language uh, materials for them. That means that Chinese speakers who are voting in Nevada will not have translated materials until 2026 because these determinations are made every five years. The reason why this is so important is because this bill will directly impact people like my parents who have been uh, residents of the U.S. for over 20 years, who took the naturalization test and became citizens, citizens and are very proud to vote in the U.S. But they don't have the language ability to fully understand ballot measures, information about um, people who are on your ballot, information about um, what districts are going to be there, especially when it comes to things like judges. They don't have the language capacity to be able to understand all of that information in English, and they very much would benefit from something like this to have have translated Chinese materials to reference when they're looking at online materials and they're looking at their individual materials as well. It's not that these community members aren't making the effort to find this information. They just don't know that the information that's available online on WeChat, on WhatsApp is accurate. And by providing information from the county, providing actual information that someone has checked and made sure it's translated accurately, that's a game changer for people when they're making those decisions at the ballot box. And this is a perfect way to show that this body that is being elected by these people is actually listening to their voters. And we really hope that you continue to support AB 246. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And I don't see anyone else down at the Sawyer Building in support of the bill. Uh, we'll come back to Carson City in support. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leo Marietta. Uh, I'm the executive director of Make the Road Nevada. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Uh, we're uh, our organization is also a member of the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition, uh, so we really value uh, civic participation in ensuring that as many Nevadans that are eligible uh, can participate and exercise their constitutional rights. Uh, AB 246 does this, helps make Nevada's democracy stronger, more vibrant, uh, and really it reflects uh, the state that we are as well as the state that we want to be. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Morietta. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Anyone else in support either here in Carson City or down at the Sawyer Building? No, nope, doesn't look like it. Uh, broadcasting, anyone on the phone lines in support of Assembly Bill 246 who wants to be heard? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of AB 246, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Aria Flores, A-R-I-A-S-L-O-R-E-S, -E and I'm here on behalf of Chiefs of Nevada, which builds the power of low-income Latinx uh, families. On behalf of our members and the broader Latinx community, and also with the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition, uh, we are in support of AB 246. Um, over the past few years, CHISPA has been actively engaged in dedicated efforts to educate and register eligible voters throughout Clark County. During our interactions with community members, we have consistently heard that voters require election materials in multiple languages in order to fully participate in our elections. By going the extra mile to ensure that materials are available in one in major languages um, here in Nevada, we take significant strides towards making the lives of our fellow Nevadans easier, while also contributing to a smoother functioning um, democratic process. This is crucial to ensure that our community has a voice in our process and that our elected officials are responsive to the challenges faced by all Nevadans. It is the utmost importance that our elections are accessible and prioritize the voting rights of every Nevadan, regardless of their preferred language. Uh, we believe that everyone should have equal opportunity to participate in our democratic process. Uh, we highly support AB 246 and hope you do too. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Deanna Huatran. That's C-E-A-N-N-A-H-U-A space T-R-A-N. And I'm the Coalition Coordinator for the Nevada Immigrant Coalition. Here on behalf of the Coalition, the Nevada Immigrant Coalition consists of diverse organizations from across the state that work together to fight for immigration reform and immigrant justice. And the NIC is in strong support of Assembly Bill 246. With the continuous growth of our immigrant, refugee, and asylee communities, 
there's an increasing demand for, for multilingual systems and resources, particularly in the context of civic engagement and voting. By investing in voting language access, we can encourage greater electoral participation that truly represents the diverse residents of Nevada. This commitment will ensure that all community members can fully exercise their voting rights and have their voices heard in the democratic process. And we ask that you continue to support AB246 um, and thank you for your time. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in strong support of AB246 this afternoon. My name is Denise Bolaños, and I'm a digital organizer with Make the Road Nevada, and we strongly support this piece of legislation as it encourages the participation of voters in this state, regardless of what their primary language is, ensuring that they are representing the needs of their diverse communities. We ask that you support this piece of legislation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Orenshaw and committee members. My name is Dayla Gibson, D-A-E-L-A-G-I-B-S-O-N, and I'm representing Planned Parenthood Marmonte, a proud member of the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition. We support this bill and ditto other supportive testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Orenshaw and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Eric Jang, E-R-I-C-J-E-N-G, I am the Director of Outreach here on representing Asian Community Development Council with uh, four offices across the state, including Las Vegas and Reno. I'm excited to have this opportunity to ask for your support for Assembly Bill 246. And first and foremost, I want to thank Assemblywoman Torres, who has been our champion for uh, language access and has taken on uh, for this bill. Also would like to thank All Voting as Local for the support and working, partnering with us in translating a community voter guide for Chinese uh, last uh, election cycle. And I also want to thank Secretary of State um, Deputy Gabriel Dakara and also Mark Lashen and also registrars from uh, Clark Lorena Perkill and Washoe's Jamie Rodriguez, Amy Bergens for Douglas County for all their input and feedback because in the end, it's the election worker trying to make sure we have accessible ballots. The core of our democracy demands that all citizens have equal opportunity and access to exercise their right to vote, regardless of the language they speak, their physical ability, or their level of literacy. Create transformational, uh, creating transformational policy that puts equity at the forefront when it comes to democracy is at the heart of the Voting Rights Act. And today, I'm very excited that we get a chance to further it just a little bit and to make sure that we can create a sustainable and equitable framework to expand language access at the polls in a way that is effective, operational, and looking at the fiscal note, fiscally responsible. So thank you so much. Hello, Justin. Hello, good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Robert Garcia, and I'm the Economic Justice Organizer for Make the Road Nevada. And I'm here to announce my strong support for AB246. I know that during elections, election language has been very tricky, so this will create the opportunity for those who not necessarily have English as a primary first language to not only understand the election material, but also create the opportunity for a fair and equitable democracy. Thank you so much. Hello, Chair and Committee members. My name is Davis Hushkon, D-A-V-I-S-H-U-S-K-O-N. I am the Executive Assistant with the Las Vegas Indian Center. And on behalf of the Las Vegas Indian Center, we are here to testify we are in strong support of AB246. We believe AB246 will allow our Native communities to recognize that our languages will be utilized for many years to come and will be available for those that are bilingual and traditional speakers. Thank you. Hello, Chair, as a member of the committee. My name is Carla Sanchez, K-A-R-L-A-S-A-N-C-H-E-Z. I am a youth organizer with Make the Road Nevada, and I'm calling in today in strong support of 
AB 246. I believe everybody should have the right for equal opportunity to vote, regardless of their language. Thank you. Oh, you're, oh, my name is J Jarrett Yost with Make the Road Nevada, spelled J-A-R-R-E-T-T-Y-O-S-T -T for the record. And I urge strong support of AB 246, and I ditto all previous support for AB 246. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jacob Egan with Make the Road Nevada, J-A-C-O-B-E-G-A-N, and I'm calling in support of AB 246 because all registered voters should have the power to make an informed decision of who they want to represent them. Some people may still be learning English and can't make a strong and informed decision for their vote, but that doesn't mean that their voice doesn't matter. If we value our democracy, we should expand language access so that everyone's voice can be heard regardless of what language they are most proficient in. It would be unethical and undemocratic to gatekeep voting access when voting is essential to our democracy. I also ditto all other comments and support. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. This is Katherine Nielsen, the Executive Director of the Nevada Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities. We are happy to support this bill. Language access is vital for people with disabilities and other accommodation needs, which includes Braille, American Sign Language, and other forms of alternate communication. This bill addresses many things, such as varying language like Chinese, Tagalog, etc. But a lot of people have failed to consider that American Sign Language is not English. So we had a lengthy conversation with the Secretary of State and the other bill sponsors for this, and they've committed to ensuring that all eligible voters will get the information in their native language. And an important example, like I discussed, is American Sign Language not being English. And the other pieces that we hope to see is that the required members of the Language Access Advisory Committee will include varying language access groups, such as those that are blind or visually impaired or deaf or in hard of hearing. Um, and we really um, support this measure. We do believe that people with developmental disabilities and other varying language access needs should receive community supports that allow them to have equal access to voting. And we're committed to working with the Secretary of State's office to ensure that those are included. Thank you so much. If you have just joined, I would like to justify in support of AB 246, press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more calls wishing to testify and support at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. With that, I'd like to go to opposition. Anyone who is opposed to the measure who wants to be heard, I'll start here in Carson City. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone here in Carson City. Down at the Sawyer Building in Las Vegas. Anyone who is opposed to the bill wants to be heard? Uh, broadcasting, I don't, I don't see anyone down at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting, can we go to the phone lines? Opposition testimony. To justify the opposition of AB 246, press star nine to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, everyone. C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Uh, I oppose this bill because simply uh, it decreases the incentive for people to assimilate to our country. In order to assimilate to our country, you have to know English. You have to have one common language that everybody else knows, just like my relatives who know two languages and have to learn English to come to the United States. I thought in order to become a voter, you have to be a U.S. citizen and you have to have some level of knowledge of English. So how does this make sense? I mean, how are people supposed to believe that non-citizens are not voting in these elections? Furthermore, there are many organizations such as Make the Road Nevada where I've seen Craigslist ads that pay people to pump these agendas and continue to shill for illegal aliens. I don't support that, and I have every suspect to believe that what they're doing is 
really in supporting a invasion and it is giving more power to non-citizens. So therefore, I oppose this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I do want to remind anyone who testifies that it's fine to speak about the bill, but I, I don't want any personal attacks against people or organizations. So thank you. Broadcasting, is there anyone else on the phone lines? Thank you, Chair. The public lines opening working. However, there are no more calls. We should testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. I wonder if we could now go to neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 246. Anyone who is neutral on the measure and wants to be heard. I'll start here in Carson City. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. Jamie Rodriguez, uh, Registrar Voter for Washoe County. Uh, up here neutral on the bill. Uh, did work with the sponsor and the proponents of the bill, but wanted to come up today to walk through a couple of the questions uh, that came up during the bill hearing um, and help provide a little bit of context. Uh, so for the question about what the definition of limited English proficiency, so that is the federal standard um, that exists. Um, that is determined then by what people fill out on their voter registration form if they elect to choose a language other than English. Um, so that's not something new that's being added here. It's copying that, that federal uh, definition. Um, also in the bill, it does stipulate uh, that the review of languages that would be um, applied to this uh, would happen in January of odd numbered years. So there is an ability to be reviewing that on a regular basis to determine if new languages need to be added or um, I think to your point, uh, Senator Severs Gansard, if, if one were to fall off because it no longer met that threshold, um, that is included in the bill. Um, and in that, right now, it, it's stipulating that we would use uh, the federal standards for determining uh, when that threshold is hit. Um, however, the bill also does add um, some of those questions to the voter registration um, to eventually be able to have enough uh, in-state specific data to be able to pull um, our specific stats of language, proficient, language proficiency uh, numbers within the state as well as the individual counties. Um, so that is also stipulated in the bill. Uh, wanted to note uh, to Senator Daly's comment, so in Washoe County currently our sample ballot, our sample ballot booklets as well as our actual mail ballots or in-person ballots are both bilingual. Um, so they are currently provided in both English and Spanish. We do do that in Washoe County because based on our population number of limited English proficiency for Spanish speakers, uh, our number seems to be wildly misrepresented. Um, and so to make sure that those who are limited English proficiency who are Spanish speakers have that information, um, who may not be willing or, or realize their ability to provide that information um, or receiving it in an easy format for them to be able to read and understand. Uh, we do provide it that way. Um, and then just wanted to talk very quickly about the process that we have in terms of language proofing that uh, Deputy Velashin did go over a little bit. Um, and there was a comment about kind of determining some of those thresholds. So yes, when we do have a new language that is added, we do have an interpretation service who will go through and, and take our materials that we provide them and do translation services for those that does include our ballots, our mailers, um, our letters, all of those types of materials. Uh, we do though also have to have somebody who's able to take those when they come back and proof them. So um, I know that uh, Senator Krasner left, uh, but to her point of three voters and not that we would want to ever disenfranchise any level of voters, but if there's three voters in a county who speak a specific language, having somebody in-house to be able to proof and make sure that those translations are correct um, is going to be extremely difficult for us to ensure that for those voters, those items are properly translated and a means to be, to be able to provide those uh, items. So I just wanted to put a couple of those things and help address those questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Registrar. Any questions for Washington County Registrar? Nope, not seeing any questions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you. Ashley Garza Kennedy representing Clark County. And I just want to ditto a lot of the comments um, that Ms. Rodriguez spoke to. And I want to thank the sponsors for working with us very early on um, on this legislation. And I did just want to talk about Clark County and kind of what we offer. So the uh, the Voting Rights Act, the Federal Voting Rights Act, does have a 10,000 threshold of people who are of voting age and who are limited English proficiency. Um, and that data is reviewed every five years and um, it's broken down on the county level. So in Clark County, we've been offering 
all of our election materials in Spanish since um, 2002 and in Tagalog since 2014. And so what that looks like in real life is any, all the experience that you have as an English speaker with your election process is the same we do for Tagalog and in Spanish. Our website gets translated in both of those languages, all of our materials, and we have staff also that um, speak both of those languages that can help voters through the process. So I just wanted to put that on the record and uh, if, I, if there's any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much for being here. Anyone else neutral here in Carson City? Uh, down at the Sawyer Building, anyone, anyone who's neutral to the measure wants to be heard. On the phone lines, uh, broadcasting, if we have anyone who's neutral to the bill. Testify neutral to AB246, press star nine to take place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chair. Um, this is Dora Martinez with Nevada Disability Action Coalition. I was actually trying to call in support. May I, pl uh, may I please proceed? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sure, of course. So this is Dora Martinez, the R-A-M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z, representing the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition. Good afternoon to you and the members of the Hard Working Committee. Um, I would like to echo the um, Ms. Uh, Catherine Nielsen, um, the Executive Director for Nevada Governor's Council on Developmental Facility. We did talk with uh, Mr. Mark Volashin, and I'm sorry if I'm killing his name, uh, from the SOS uh, Secretary of State, and let Nevada vote with Mr. Cesar, and, and they are willing to work with us to make um, equitable um, language um, accessible to all. And I would like to thank the sponsor, um, Selena Torres, for bringing this bill. And just an, a, big, a quick note for those who don't know, even though people um, who speak English is a second or third or, like myself, fourth language, we do pay tax and we are able to vote and we appreciate you and everyone who um, are going to support this bill. Please pass it. Thank you. Chair, sure, there are no more calls wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Ramos, any closing comments you'd like to make? We appreciate you being here to present the bill while Assemblyman Torres is on the floor of the Assembly. Thank you very much for pinch hitting for her and uh, feel free to make any closing comments you'd like to make. I would just like to thank again this committee for considering this bill and we urge your support so we can get voted on the floor and hopefully become um, a law. Um, as everyone has already stated, there is an urgent need and um, every voter deserves um, to have their, um, deserves to have the opportunity to cast a ballot and their voices heard. So thank you so much for your consideration. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 246 and we'll open the hearing on Assembly Bill 192. Our, the sponsor of that measure, uh, Assemblyman Gonzalez is also on the floor right now, on the assembly floor, but we are very fortunate today to have our Chief Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Gabriel Tachara here, and Emily Prasad Zamora here, who are co-presenters in the bill, and they're willing to pinch hit and solo present the bill today while our assembly colleague is on the floor. Thank you both for, for being here today and for, for presenting the bill. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Orenshaw, members of the committee. Uh, Gabriel DeCare, for the record, Chief Deputy Secretary of State. Um, Assembly Bill 192 from uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez um, has sort of two separate provisions, one relating to uh, electioneering and the other that deals with um, the, the form and implementation of the uh, universal mail ballots. So I'm actually going to hand it over to Emily to talk through the electioneering piece first. Good afternoon. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon, for the record. My name is Emily Prasad Zamora, and again, that's spelled P E R S A U D hyphen Z A M O R A. Maybe by the end of session, you might have my last name memorized. Um, so, um, first and foremost, um, ex I'm sorry, Executive Director of Silver State Voices, um, to go over the electioneering piece, um, there is a couple of different aspects. I'm going here. Um, so with the electioneering piece, um, there is, 
what we requested in this particular piece of legislation it is that there is signage uh, located at every election site um, that currently allows electioneering. As you may be familiar with Nevada uh, NRS statute, um, electioneering is uh, allowed in most locations, um, but um, private entities do have the ability to indicate that they do not want electioneering at their site. Um, if a site does want electioneering to occur um, at their particular location, um, then this bill would require that an electioneering sign be uh, at each polling location at the 100 feet um, mark. Um, with the particular sign requirements that we are asking for in this particular bill is that each sign is at least 11 inches by 17 inches in size, um, that it's placed on a window or door of the polling place uh, or freestanding, and that it's visible to a person approaching the boundary marked by the sign. Um, we picked this particular size um, through having many conversations with the registrars, and this was the size that um, we agreed upon, the assemblywoman agreed upon, um, and the county registrars. Um, the reason why we said, uh, I want, one of the uh, questions that we usually get a lot is, why freestanding um, and a majority of the voting locations there is a window or a door uh, but there are counties like Clark County that has particular tents um, and so for those that they don't have you know a door or a window um, and it's particular uh, that's why we have the freestanding aspect to that uh, part of the bill sure. thank you very uh, much thank you yes um, yes Thank you, Emily. Uh, so the, the other elements of this bill relate to um, mail ballots, uh, both in, in form and then also in the sort of operational uh, needs of, of having a universal mail ballot elections. Um, uh, several sections of this bill would require the Secretary of State's office to uh, determine a, a sort of universal format for mail ballots so that ballots would be um, uh, ballots would be similarly formatted and appear visually similar across all of the counties. Um, this does not, uh, th th that provision would not require counties to purchase any new machinery, et cetera, dif different machines, uh, process ballots of different sizes, different ways. This would just be in terms of what the envelope looks like, um, the requirements, what the ballot looks like when you open the envelope um, to provide additional uh, uh, to provide opportunities for voter education. We want everyone's ballots to look the same. That would also allow the Secretary of State's office to do more work um, uh, reaching out to voters and communicating about the their mail ballots. Um, another provision would require the Secretary of State's office to include a uh, some sort of visual distinction uh, between ballots of neighboring counties. Um, we did see in, in previous elections when there are a bunch of ballots, if they look all the same and they're all sitting in a, a uh, in terms of whether they're at the post office or they are being individually sorted. We know that, uh, for example, ballots from Carson City ended up in Story County or vice versa. Um, this would require the Secretary of State's office to provide a way of easily telling ballots from neighboring counties, being able to differentiate them uh, one from another. Um, the, the largest chunk of this bill and, and the, the part of this bill that has the largest fiscal note attached um, would require uh, the Secretary of State's office to have a single statewide contract for um, mail ballots, envelopes, um, et cetera. Uh, that is out of a, a few different needs. Um, at present, uh, there is a paper shortage going on nationwide um, that has made printers look at some of their smaller contracts especially and occasionally uh, drop, um, drop contracts with counties because they did not represent a, a, a large enough of a uh, profit of a, of a revenue stream to be viable as a customer. So the Secretary of State's office is um, helping out however we can. We believe with a single statewide contract, this would provide uh, the, the buying power of our largest counties to help our smaller counties um, uh, n not lose these these very these very important contracts. Um, 
we already reimburse for envelopes, ballot stock, postage, et cetera. Uh, last biennium, the Secretary of State's office reimbursed about $8 million to counties. That did not cover all of the costs um, that would have been taken into account under this new bill. Um, and that was not all from the general fund. That was a combination of uh, general fund and, and also some federal funding as well. Uh, the, the fiscal note on this bill, if we did have a unified statewide contract, would be approximately, it would be just under $4 million per election. Um, we believe that that actually reflects a cost savings to the state if you take into account how much money uh, the, the counties will be saving individually and the fact that we will be able to conduct all of these elections more affordably. Again, um, this is not going to be the Secretary of State telling the counties what they have to do. Uh, the, th this is just for the purposes of having a vendor who would be required to fulfill the needs of uh, each of the individual counties. Um, I think that that is all that I have on that. Emily, was there anything else from you? I, no, I think that that pretty much sums up um, the totality of the bill and we're open for any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much. Thank you for pinch hitting and uh, going from co-presenting to solo presenting the bill while Assemblyman Gonzalez is on the floor. Any questions, members on Assembly Bill 192? Senator Sieber Scanser. And then uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You, you know, in looking at the, the printing of the, the ballots together, I, it, it just seems like that's not something you have to legislate. I just think that you should be able to look at a procurement process and maybe you work together, have an MOU for procurement versus putting it in statute. I think that's kind of strange, to be honest with you, that you're requiring them. Because then you also have like one vendor for the entire state and what if something goes wrong with that vendor. So I think we have procurement processes throughout the state, you know, for each county. But, but also you could have an MOU to be able to do that versus put it in statute. Um, and then the, the sign posting, I mean, I don't think, I don't think there's really issues in, in doing that, posting signs. But, you know, just and the differentiation between the counties, the ballots, is that so you don't have someone put a mail ballot in the wrong county's drop box? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Severs Gansert, Gabriel DeCare for the record. Um, to, to answer that last point first, I, I believe the answer is yes. We, we, there were counties, and actually maybe uh, Deputy Veloshin can speak to that directly. We, we know there were some ballots from other counties kicking around. Do you want to talk about some of those specifics, Mark? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Mark Velashin, for the record. Um, and, and that exact uh, situation did happen, uh, especially in areas like in Carson City, where an individual may live into, in a different uh, county, not realizing that they got a ballot that needs to be dropped off in a box that's specific to that county. Um, it, the mail process is, is slightly uh, better, of course, in, in, in fielding and getting those ballots back to the, the elected official in that county. Uh, but really, the concern is if when individuals drop ballots in Dropbox on Election Day, uh, because there are timelines required to receive it uh, and make sure that it's it's received prior to the close of polls at 7 p.m., um, seeing those the, the colored ballots and recognizing or, or somehow indicating that this is uh, one color and the other county adjacent to us is another, um, that happened and we suspect will continue to happen going forward, which is why we included that provision. And, and then just another kind of question comment. So if we get the top-down system, um, do you foresee individuals being able to vote in any county? So it'll be sort of like a, um, like a what do we call that, a voting, you know how you can vote? Voting, vote yeah, like a vote center. Will every polling place become a vote center statewide? And so, you know, I guess, you know, is that part of the, the objectives of being able to have a top down system? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Mark Veloshin, for the record. Uh, no, that, that is not part of Assembly Bill 192. Uh, in fact, I don't believe that's even been considered or discussed uh, the idea of having uh, the ability for a, a, an elector in Nevada to vote in any county. Um, that we're certainly open to discussing it if that's something that you'd like. Right, and it's, it's about casting the votes, right? How right, you cast your votes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and S Senator Severs Gansert, for your, your earlier concerns around the, the contracts, um, it's, it's my understanding that, um, well, one, although there, there may be possibilities for some sort of MOU, I believe a statutory change would be required for there to be a statewide contract. Um, even, frankly, if all of the counties who have been dropped by their vendors were to unite together, they would still probably not raise to the threshold of being able to get that vendor back. Um, there are very few print vendors who can um, turn out the, the scale of work that needs to be done for an election as large as ours. Clark County, for example, um, has, uh, has a vendor that could uh, 
basically if a vendor can handle Clark County, they can handle the entire state. Um, but I, I'm not sure if that's possible uh, with, without a uh, w without a change in statute. The other provision that was amended into this bill um, on the assembly side would require the vendor, and this is not currently in statute, um, it would require the vendor to drop the ballots, uh, to, to drop the ballots in the state of Nevada, as opposed to ballots being mailed from, let's say the vendor was in Arizona or Colorado, um, and they were to put the ballots in the mail in Arizona or Colorado, all of a sudden we've got Nevadans who are receiving ballots at all sorts of different times. This would increase uh, uniformity across the state. Um, thank you, and, and you know, just to, again, the comment, if you have one vendor doing all of it, if, if that vendor doesn't live up to the expectations, and then there's always an issue around uh, bulk mail, Right, you, you, it's hard to count on bulk bulk mail to deliver at certain times. So, anyway, I guess I'm concerned. My concerns are using one vendor requiring that per statute versus developing. That I'm not sure if uh, the state law prohibits that you can't look at purchasing for other counties if they join you if they want to join you in doing that or not. So, anyway, just some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Daly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I was just going to mention what uh, Senator from Reno was saying. I know you can do joinder and various things. There's nothing in this that prohibits you to having multiple vendors if you wanted to. You can say you could split it up. You can do do, do some of those things. Um, so the vendor, does the vendor now, they get to print. They obviously have to buy the paper. They do they also then act as the mail house uh, sometimes where they'll put it all together and then mail it out or do they give the material to the county and the county sends it out or can you do it both ways? Obviously there's economies of scale uh, on doing that. I know we have uh, joinders, what it's called, for several other purchasing areas of the state. We outlawed it in construction, it's a bad idea, but uh, good for other stuff. Thank you for the question, Senator Mark Velasco, for the record. Uh, you are right that the bill does not prohibit uh, a statewide contract from having multiple vendors. Um, if there are situations in the different counties where new systems are purchased and that requires a capability outside of one vendor, there, there is certainly opportunity for that sort of diversification to make sure that we're meeting the state's requirements. Um, and, and then second, uh, it depends. The, the as-is process right now uh, is, is a little of both, where some counties uh, have uh, in-house uh, the ability to produce and distribute and mail out their ballots. Uh, going forward, though, and certainly in our larger counties, uh, the system is set up where they order them through a vendor, uh, oftentimes out of state, though certainly something we're looking at is trying to identify an in-state vendor, who then, uh, as you had suggested, uh, acts as a single repository that gathers the paper, takes care of the postage piece of it as well, um, and, and really works to build the ballot with the, the county election official as well. Um, so that the, the comment about the, the scale, absolutely um, a, a big part of what we're looking at here to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the state while, while being as, as careful uh, with the taxpayer dollars as possible. Um. Senator Daly, Gabriel DeCara for the record, and, and to follow up on that, you know, this, the, the, this amendment, which we're very grateful, this, all of these uh, vendor provisions, which we're very grateful to Assemblywoman Gonzalez for uh, including in her bill, they really did come out of um, several of our smaller counties having vendors uh, drop them um, at, at, at some points in very uh, difficult places in, in the timeline. Um, we did receive, uh, I believe, two weeks ago at this point, who knows, uh, communication from uh, NASA, the National Association of State Election Directors, um, and CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency for the United States, that the paper shortage was not expected to abate, abate in advance of 2024, um, and that all, uh, all elections departments that were looking at um, having the, the scale of paper ballots or mail ballots um, that the state of Nevada is should secure their paper as soon as possible. Um, and it is still difficult for those smaller counties to, to find vendors. So we, we look at this, even if it is multiple vendors, to, to your point, um, we're looking at this as a, as a provision that will really help us keep our elections secure because what we don't want to have happen is a, a vendor drop a county right in advance of the presidential preference primary or let a county know between the primary and the general election that they can no longer fulfill their their contract. One last comment, just to, to illustrate that. In 2020, we heard the same morning, also asked the counties, the counties validated with their vendors that they were good, and all of them were told, absolutely, we have the paper that you need. 
until they didn't, until our counties were told that the contracts were canceled. Now with the open enrollment for insurance this fall, uh, there is an absolute chance that it will jeopardize the, the presidential preference primary in February uh, without this, this bill moving forward. And for so maybe we should suspend junk mail for a little while. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so, so second question is on the uh, electioneering part. So, with the language that that you're changing or is being proposed to be changed, where it says express, expressly refers to it, maybe it's a legal question. I don't know. Do you guys think that's more or less restrictive, uh, the old language versus the new? I can go either way on the interpretation. I'm just curious what you guys are intending or thinking. Emily Prasad, some more for the record. Um, our intent is not to make it more or less restrictive. I think it was, um, from our conversations, it was just a little bit of a cleanup um, because from our experience um, at the polls, uh, at times there was a little bit of confusion um, as to what is or what is not allowed um, at the polling locations. And so the intent was just to clean it up uh, to make it a little bit more uh, clear as to what is legally permissible. And I appreciate that. And you'll have to keep attempting because um, expressly refers is kind of like uh, and the people from the Secretary of State's office is like when you're doing campaign stuff or whatever, expressly advocates, right? Uh, whether or not it's it's this or that, and uh, it's it's a gray area. I'm just curious what uh, you guys were thinking. Thank you very much, members. Any additional questions regarding Assembly Bill 192? Okay, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Thank you very much again for uh, pinch hitting here for our colleague in the Assembly. Appreciate uh, you helping present the bill today. With that, I would like to go to support to Assembly Bill 192. I'll start here in Carson City. Then we can go down to the store building. Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Dermick, and I'm the Nevada State Director at Albany's Local Action, an organization that exists to expose and dismantle threats to voter freedom in order to make voting safe, fair, and accessible, and to build a democracy for us all. All Voting's Local Action is also a member of the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition. We believe that voting should be convenient and accessible to all voters. Standardizing mail ballots across counties will reduce confusion for voters and make mail ballot envelopes a unique color will help ensure voters, mail carriers, and election workers are better able to identify these forms. Ad additionally, by ensuring there is proper signage for electioneering, poll workers will be able to focus their energy on running a voting site and assisting voters to participate in our democracy. Therefore, we support AB 192. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cassie Charles. I'm the Campaign Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada uh, here in support of Assembly Bill 192 to ensure clear signage at polling locations and uniform vote-by-mail envelopes. Having a uniform mail ballot envelope is the start to simplify the process for voters statewide and will make education and, and outreach easier, particularly ensuring ballots are signed and able to be easily verified. We urge your support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We are here today in strong support of AB 192 because every single eligible voter should be able to cast their ballot in a manner that is most accessible to them. Mail-in ballots were vastly used statewide by all parties and nonpartisan voters here in our state. In fact, during the 2020 Boulder City Municipal Election, 57% of the voter turnout cast their mail ballot their ballots by mail. This system is uniform of un uniformity would create a more well-rounded voting system for those who cast their ballots this way. We also have seen firsthand the need to cl for clear signage at polling locations while doing voter protection. I have seen sticky notes on trees at sites we have worked at and that's just not acceptable. We see that the system, this system is so, is so fairly new to this state, and with it being so new, we need to allow the system to grow and change for the better. We urge you all to support this bill, and thank you. 
Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Magnus. Uh, anyone else here in Carson City who wish to testify in support of Assembly Bill 192? All right, down at the Sawyer Building in Las Vegas. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. My name is Amy Koo, A-M-Y-K-O-O, -O, and I'm the Acting Deputy Director with One API Nevada, uh, here to say ditto to all the other comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else down at the Sawyer Building unless they're uh, outside the door there, but uh, so uh, broadcasting, not seeing anyone else in Carson City or Las Vegas. Can we go to the phone lines in support of Assembly Bill 192? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of AB 192, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair Orenshaw and committee members. My name is Daley Gibson, D-A-E-L-A-G-I-B-S-O-N, and I'm representing Planned Parenthood Marmonte, again, a proud member of the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition. We support this bill and ditto other supportive testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Happy Thursday. Uh, for the record, my name is Aria Flores, A-R-I-A-F-L-O-R-E-S, and I'm here on behalf of Chiefs of Nevada with the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition. Um, we're in support of AB 182. It's essential that proper signage is uh, readable and at least 18 by 12 inches in size. Um, this will ensure that people can clearly understand the electioneering regulations. In 2022, I was volunteering at the Centennial Hills low polling location here in Las Vegas, and it took several hours to even notice the electioneering sign was up um, because it was not noticeable on the tree it was on. Um, I had to stand within five feet of the printed sign to even read what seemed like like a 12-point font text. Um, by properly displaying the electioneering signs, we can ensure that everyone is aware of where the boundaries are. Uh, so I encourage you to support AB 192. Thank you for your time. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Carla Sanchez, K-A-R-L-A-S-A-N-C-H-E-Z. I am a youth organizer with Make the Road Nevada. We are a membership-driven and membership-led organization that represents more than thousands of working-class Nevadans, many of whom sacrifice time in their families and work to take part in the legislative process. On behalf of our members, we are in strong support of AB 192 and thank the bill sponsor and the presenters with Silver State Voices for bringing this bill forward. Thank you. Hello, Chair and Committee members. My name is Davis Hushkon, D-A-V-I-S-H-U-S-K-O-N. I am the Executive Assistant with the Las Vegas Indian Center. We are in support of AB 192. AB 192 will allow easier access for voters to identify at all locations and information provided will grant voters structured and easy visible access specialized to suit individual voters who require those amenities. Thank you. Chair, there are no more calls which need to testify and support at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. I'd like to now go to opposition to Assembly Bill 192. I'll start up here in Carson City. Anyone who's opposed to the measure and wants to be heard on the record? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone in Carson City. I don't see anyone down at the Sawyer Building in Las Vegas. So broadcasting, can we go to the phone lines for opposition to Assembly Bill 192? Testify in opposition of AB 192. Press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. I'd like to now go to neutral on Assembly Bill 192. Anyone who is neutral on the bill but wants to make a statement on the record here in Carson City? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Don't see anyone down at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting, is there anyone neutral on the phone lines on Assembly Bill 192? To testify neutral to AB 192, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. A-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. -J -J I wanted to testify in opposition, uh, but I wasn't able to do so. 
So I'm just in opposition. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you very much. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in New York at this time. Thank you. And I wondered if our co-presenters uh, have any closing comments you'd like to make. You're welcome to if you'd like to, but you don't have to. Thank you so much, Chairman Orenshaw. Uh, for the record, Emily Prasad Zamora. The only other thing that we wanted to say is uh, we want to thank Assemblywoman Gonzalez for carrying this bill and for the opportunity to present on her behalf. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Prasad Zamora. With that, we'll close the hearing on Assembly Bill 192, and I see that we've got Speaker Yeager. Good afternoon, Speaker. Thank you for joining us with your hectic schedule as we race towards Sine Die. Thank you for presenting Assembly Bill 399 today. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Orenshaw and members of the committee. It is a pleasure to be here in front of you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Yeager. I represent Assembly District 9 in Southwest Las Vegas. And it's an honor to present to you Assembly Bill 399 in its first reprint. Um, this bill creates the Subcommittee on Education Accountability of the Interim Finance Committee. Now I'm looking over here and I know for sure that uh, Senator Gansert serves on the Senate Finance Committee. And so here's the genesis of this bill. Um, I'll tell you sort of where it came from and then what it does. So we've talked quite a bit this session um, about the historic amounts of funding that we're giving to our K-12 education system. And in the context of that, having some accountability around that and having some transparency around that. And so we did something in the Joint Ways and Senate Finance Committee that we've never done before as a legislature. We had each of the 17 school districts appear in front of us, uh, the superintendents, and then the charter school authority appear in front of us as well during session. So the legislators had a chance to ask questions and specifically to ask questions about what their plans were for uh, spending the money that was gonna be allocated under the pupil-centered funding formula. So we were able to hear their plans about giving educators raises, hear their plans about programming that they would do, and candidly hear about some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, you know, the large school districts, Clark and Washoe, are very different from some of our smaller school districts. And we spent uh, two very long days hearing from those school districts, and I think it was very valuable. I think it was valuable for legislators to be able to ask questions. I think it was valuable for the superintendents to be able to talk about their challenges. And I think for members of the public who tuned in to see um, what this was about. And so out of that idea, out of that those presentations came this idea that why shouldn't we do that more often? You know, as a legislature, we fund education and we fund it through the pupil-centered funding formula, but that money basically gets passed through to the districts and there's not really an opportunity for us as a legislature to be able to speak directly with the districts when it comes to funding and what's happening with the funding. So what this bill does is it takes the, the um, existing interim finance committee and it creates a subcommittee on education accountability, members of the Senate, members of the assembly, and it basically requires that, um, I believe it's every six months, that they will conduct a hearing and they will be able to call in front of them um, superintendents of school districts, uh, the superintendent of public education, State Board of Education, and basically ask questions. And specifically in the context of what we're doing this session, I think they'll be able to ask questions about uh, following up on what we were told during these hearings at the legislative session. You know, did, were you able to spend the money in the way that you anticipated? Um, what programs did you invest in? Did it work or did it not work? And maybe more importantly, uh, if, if something different happened than what they told us at those hearings, we can ask why. Was there some barrier that was put in place? And I'm hoping through this process that the legislature during session and the interim finance committee during the interim can just have more, more of their hands in what's going on uh, in the education space because so often we get asked by our constituents, well, you're giving a lot of money to the districts. What are they doing with it? This bill here will give us, I think, that sense of transparency, that we're able to ask those questions in a structured way, and we're able to maintain and foster relationships with the superintendents 
um, of the school districts and the public charter school authority. So the rest of the language is sort of the, the normal stuff we have in bills like this, um, but, but that is uh, the idea here. And, and uh, you know, I, I won't go into too much detail because there's another bill that's probably not going to be in front of this committee, but this is the what I call the uh, transparency bill. There is also an accountability bill where the LCB audit team would get involved in doing performance audits of the district. That bill, I don't know if it's over here yet, but I wanted to let you know this really is a two-part thought here on the legislature's involvement in K-12 public education funding, and this is that step one of transparency. So uh, knowing that your time is short and you have a lot of work to do, Chair, I would leave it there but would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Speaker Yeager, and I really like this bill. It reminds me of uh, the Committee on Industrial Programs that reports to the Interim Finance Committee on the Silver State Industries and Work Programs at NDOC, so I, I appreciate this extra accountability that the bill could bring. Any questions for Speaker Yeager? Senator Sievers Gansert. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I, so I'm looking at this bill, and it's effective upon passage and approval, and then it's got, uh, we've got to meet every six months. So I'm kind of wondering about the clock on the six months and then during session years, right? So I don't, I, versus, you know, like twice a year non-session years or something like that every six months because the clock is not, I mean, if this, if this passes and it's beginning of June, right, then you do something in December. So just figuring out what that cycle should be and whether we should be meeting um, during session years on that type of um, period, those periods. Steve Yeager, for the record, through you, Chair, to... Please go directly to the member. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, Senator, ex excellent question, um, and I'm trying to find it in here because there is a provision in here. This is the problem with this time of session because it's, it's not a long bill and, like, I can't find it in two pages, but there, there is a provision that says a meeting during the session would count as a meeting of the Interim Finance Committee. Um, and perhaps <laughs> well, so I, I see items similar to subsection four, so you're right. So um, section three, number two, has that. Um, yeah, I still not quite sure how to set the clock because it's every, so first of all, I should have started out with thank you for bringing this because I think this is very important and I think it, it was a really interesting experience to have all the schools come to tell us what they thought they were going to do with the money. I, I think it was in, informative and also just sort of the gaps of information. And then, you know, something else, and we did have that meeting. The information just like wasn't consistent in some respects. Like we asked them for something, but we didn't really necessarily get what they asked. Um, and in here, there's quite a bit of discussion about fiscal policy, monetary policy. There's one line that talks about, you know, like pupil outcomes, achievements and outcomes, and um, but it's still related to revenue. And I think it'd be important to have some conversations about what are, what are your plans to improve literacy? What are your plans to improve math specifically? And, and I know, you know, over the years, we've had the superintendents come in. Sometimes the, the rural counties give us like a really in-depth look of what they do. We've learned sort of their nuts and bolts and the big counties, it's just sort of, this is where big buckets of money go and we don't really know how it's gonna work. So just some thoughts on, um, you know, if, if, if we need to tidy this up a little bit or expand a little bit about um, it, reporting on achievement or if we need to standardize sort of expectations too. Uh, Steve Yeager, for the record, uh, thank you for the, the questions and the comment. I think to get back to the first question, I would envision this being like, you know, you meet, you have a meeting every six months, a meeting the first six months of the year, the second six months of the year, and that would dovetail nicely with session because we're generally here February to June. Um, I think there's going to be some flexibility there uh, from the chair. In terms of, you know, what they're going to look at, we, it's always a little tricky because, right, you don't want to put too much specific in there, but you want to give some guidance. And so I think the language says they may study without limitation. So I think there's some suggestions there. But I think it's flexible enough that the chair of the subcommittee, um, I think, could really uh, limit that. For instance, in the first meeting of the year, maybe they just want to talk about fiscal stuff. In, this, in the second one, maybe they want to talk about outcomes. Um, but certainly open to suggestions for things we can do. And, and I, I should note this has been a session where there's been a lot of talk about transparency and accountability um, in education and public education, uh, and rightfully so, when we're putting this kind of an investment into education. I think that's important. I just wanted to note that there are also other bills that have accountability type transparency. I think about um, uh, the Governor's Assembly Bill 400, which has a lot of tasks for the Commission on School Funding, and so some of that ties in, and then I think there's a Senate Bill 98 that has some Commission on School Funding, so I think 
uh, even though we only have four or five days left, I think we're trying to make sure that what we're doing here fits together and we're not duplicating efforts. I would see this piece as the legislature's chance to ask those questions that we get from our constituents. And sometimes it's kind of hard to get an answer um, and always nice to get an answer on the record. Right, so, so everyone can have access to that. And I see the Commission on School Funding probably more as the analytical sort of fiscal policy experts. So I think these two concepts can work together. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that we're there yet, but we've got a few days to figure it out. But uh, that's a long way of saying, um, you know, I'm open to whatever the committee would like to see in terms of if there's some changes that should be made to the bill, that would be the committee's pleasure and I would be open to that. Um, thank you, and, and I, again, appreciate this legislation because it really was an interesting process, and you are absolutely correct. We don't speak to our school districts. We speak to the superintendent of schools at the, at the um, state level, and we don't necessarily get that opportunity, so I think that was really helpful for us, and so I'm, I, I, you know, I'm very supportive of this measure and the other measures that we're looking at for accountability and transparency. Um, and I'm, I don't know if you're going to want to amend it or not, but it's the time thing is just a little little wonky just because it depends upon when you start and versus like biennial or not or not biannual 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 not quite sure but um, you know how it happens is time escapes us and all of a sudden we haven't had a meeting for a while and then you've got to like get it in within the six months whatever whenever that clock starts thank you thank you Senator Sievers cancer any additional questions I'm not seeing any additional questions thank you speaker Yeager for presenting the bill and uh, you're welcome to stick around and make closing comments but I know you're very busy so if you need to go we uh, completely understand thank you, thank you I'd like to now open to support for assembly bill 399 here in Carson City I'm not seeing anyone in support don't see anyone down at the Sawyer building broadcasting is there anyone on the phone lines who wishes to speak in support of assembly bill 399 Testify in support of AB 399. Press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no calls. We should testify in support at this time. Thank you. Now I'd like to go to opposition. Anyone who's opposed to Assembly Bill 399 wants to be heard on the record. Here in Carson City, I'm not seeing anyone come forward. I don't see anyone down in Las Vegas at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the phone lines who wishes to speak in opposition? to Assembly Bill 399. To testify the opposition of AB 399, press star 9 to take a place in the queue. Chair, there are no calls wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. I'd like to now go to neutral on Assembly Bill 399. Anyone who's neutral on the measure here in Carson City? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Don't see anyone down at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting anyone on the phone lines who is neutral on the measure and wants to be heard. To testify neutral to AB 399, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify neutral at this time. Thank you. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 399. And we're very fortunate to have uh, one of our, our colleagues from the Assembly, Majority Leader Howdigi. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. And we will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 239. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you for your flexibility. I know it's been a lot of moving parts today. And thank you. We were very lucky that when Assembly went to floor, we had some co-presenters. and. Appreciate you being here. I know you've got a million things to do. So thank you for being here. And once you are done, feel free to, to leave. And uh, we, we can, after um, the questions, thank you. Please go ahead, Majority Leader. Thank you. Chair and thank you committee members and I appreciate your flexibility as well I know we've all been trying to figure out how we can be at three places at one time and somehow we're managing to get it done getting thank you um, I'm Assemblywoman Sandra Howdy I represent Assembly District 41 but today I am here as chair of the Sunset Subcommittee of the Legislative Commission for the 21-22 interim to present Assembly Bill 239 which incorporates various recommendations approved by the subcommittee Chair and committee members, the primary duty of the Sunset Subcommittee is to review all boards, commissions, and similar entities in Nevada that are created by statute and determine whether each entity should be continued, modified, consolidated with another entity, or terminated. The subcommittee must also recommend improvements to the entities that are to be continued, modified, or consolidated. During the 2021, inter 
2021-22 interim, the subcommittee held six meetings, during which we reviewed 18 entities and received reports from sev several entities previously reviewed in the past interims. The recommendations included in Assembly Bill 239 concern seven of these entities. I would note that most, if not all, of these recommendations were requested by the respective boards, committees, and commissions. I have with me the subcommittee's policy analyst, Cesar Malgarejo, to help answer questions. It's been almost a year since we sat in Sunset Interim <laughs> Subcommittee, and so my brain is a little fuzzy because I've seen many other bills in the last few months, so I'm probably going to rely on my phone in front of for some questions. Um, Chair, with your permission, I will walk the committee through the bill. Please go ahead. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, perfect. Sections 1, 2, 15, and 16 address the Merit Award Board. These sections respectively create the Merit Award account in the State General Fund, remove language prohibiting an award to be paid out of the General Fund. It makes an appropriation for $3,000 to fund the administration of the board and makes an additional appropriation of $25,000 to provide funding for Merit Awards to state employees from the Merit Award Program. Those dollars, if not expended, are to revert back to the General Fund. I understand we do not discuss um, money in the policy committees, but for reference, the subcommittee recommended these legislative actions because representatives of the board reported that the board did not have funds for its operations, nor could it fund employee awards if someone did submit for it. Section 3 of the bill requires the Advisory Council for Family Engagement to, within 30 days before the beginning of the term of any member appointed to the council, or within 30 days after such a position becomes vacant, submit notification of a vacancy to the appointing authority, either the Superintendent of Public Instruction or Legislative Leadership. We just um, put the onus on the board to notify the appointing member people of vacancies because one of the things that we found consistent during the sunset subcommittee hearings was that um, there were so many vacancies across these boards and commissions that they couldn't meet quorum or they couldn't meet and sometimes it was because people were never appointed to fill these vacancies. Section 4 revises the makeup of the committee for the statewide alert system to decrease the total number of committee members from 15 to 11. By decreasing from 5 to 3 the number of members appointed by the governor who represent local law enforcement agencies and state law enforcement agencies. In addition, the committee is required to submit to the governor a list of persons qualified for membership as representatives of local and state law enforcement agencies, with consideration given to whether the nominees will represent the demographic diversity of Nevada. Again, this came at a recommendation of the Department of Public Safety because they could not find people to fill these seats. They requested that the number be reduced from 5 to 3 to help them meet quorum. Sections 8 through 9 make changes to the Committee on Testing for Intoxication, as requested by the Department of Public Safety. It allows them to study and make recommendations to the Director of the Department of Public Safety regarding practices, technologies, and methods of detective and determining the presence and the effect of driving under the influence of intoxicating liquor, controlled substance, or other prohibited substances. It further certifies uh, devices and methods to test a person's blood, urine, or other sample to determine the presence of or concentration of alcohol, a controlled substance, or another prohibited substance, and create a list of those devices or methods. Again, these were recommendations um, brought to us by the Committee on Testing for Intoxication. They felt that they had their, they weren't being fully utilized and that they could expand the scope of what they could do, so they came and requested that we further expand their um, scope. Sections 11 and 12 amend provisions to authorize the Commissioner of Insurance to call a meeting and schedule the time and place of a meeting on the appeal, Appeals Panel for Industrial Insurance. Section 13 amends provisions concerning the Medical Laboratory Advisory Committee to require the committee to, one, meet at least once per year, and two, review member vacancies annually, and if a vacancy exists, submit a letter to the State Board of Health with a recommendation to fill the vacancy. Finally, Section 14 addresses the Credit Union Advisory Council to delete the provisions that entitle the members of the council to receive a salary and to provide that the council may meet at least once every six months. And so um, instead of sunsetting some of these committees, we took their recommendations and continued to keep them on. There was a couple of uh, committees that don't regularly meet and just requested that maybe we um, change their meeting requirements but keep them on there was industry support for these committee for these commissions to continue and so we took their recommendations um, both even for the credit union advisory council they have 
in the past foregone their salary, they've always given it back. So they requested that we just change it in statute so that they don't have to vote on it at every meeting to forego their salary since they don't take it to just take it out of statute. Um, with that, Chair, we are open for questions. Thank you very much, Majority Leader. Thank you. Any questions, members? No, I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you so much for being here. And again, if you have to leave, we completely understand. We know you're a very busy day today. Anyone who is in support of Assembly Bill 239, now is the uh, opportunity to speak here in Carson City. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you for the record. Trey Abney here today representing the Nevada Broadcasters Association. Uh, we support this bill, specifically Section 4, that reduces the number of members required for the statewide alert system. That's the statewide Amber Alert uh, Commission. They've had issues with uh, staffing up and and getting enough people to be on that. So this will help us do that and make sure that, that can, they can meet and do their business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Abney. Appreciate your testimony in support. Um, Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Carter Bundy with AFSCME. Um, it was an honor to work with Majority Leader Howard Gee during the interim on this. The Merit Award Board is not a large board. It's not a lot of money, but we think it sends an important signal that if state employees can find ways <coughs> to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of state government services, they can get a small stipend to incent them for that. So uh, we hope that you'll support this. We think this is something that improves the efficiency and effectiveness of state government, which is hopefully something everyone can support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bundy. Anyone else in support of AB 239? Don't see anyone in Carson City. Don't see anyone at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting anyone on the phone lines in support of Assembly Bill 239. To testify in support of AB 239, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no calls which is to testify in support at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. I'd like to go to opposition. Anyone opposed to Assembly Bill 239? Here in Carson City? I'm not seeing anyone. I don't see anyone down at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting, anyone on the phone lines in opposition to Assembly Bill 239? To testify in opposition of AB 239, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Neutral. Anyone who is neutral on Assembly Bill 239, either here in Carson City or down at the Sawyer Building? I'm not seeing anyone. Broadcasting. Anyone neutral on the measure on... AB 239 wants to be heard. To testify neutral to AB 239, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify neutral at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 239. And uh, Assemblyman De Silva, thank you for joining us today. I, uh, I was told that you're here to help present Assembly Bill 243. So thank you so much for joining us, and I believe uh, uh, you're going to help us and uh, walk through the bill. And also, we've got uh, our, le our legislative counsel, Mr. Powers, to help us answer some questions and, and our nonpartisan staff. So thank you both for being here to help with this bill from the Interim Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections, which I was very lucky to be a member of and get to participate in some of the discussions on this. And appreciate uh, you both being here to uh, co-present Assembly Bill 243. With that, we'll open the hearing on AB 243. Thank you, Senator, and uh, distinguished members of the committee. Again, this was just placed on me about five minutes ago. I know our, uh, our chair, uh, Chair Gorlo, is actually uh, is, uh, conducting a, uh, her business in uh, ways and means. So excuse me if I'm not too well versed in the, especially the, uh, the amendments that were, uh, that were placed uh, into this uh, bill. No worries. Uh, I had to actually, <laughs> with the help of uh, Director Anthony in the Research Division, try to refresh my memory about some of the discussion mm -hmm. from the interim. So thank, we appreciate you being here to pinch hit for thank your you, thank colleague. You. Thank you. And I also want to you know, thank uh, uh, Council Powers here for also co-presenting this bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair 
and members of the committee. For the record, I am Assemblyman Ruben De Silva, representing Assembly District 28 in Clark County. I am pleased to present Assembly Bill 243 today. This bill revises provisions relating to legislative affairs, specifically the legislature's interim activities. As you are all aware, the legislature is only in session for 120 days of every odd number of year. However, during the interim, the legislature still meet to study certain issues and formulate recommendations for new legislation to be considered for the next legislative session. During the 2021 session, the legislature passed AB 443, which significantly changed the interim committee structure. The bill repealed several existing statutory interim committee, uh, committees and formed new joint interim standing committees that paralleled the issues, issue areas of the committees during session. For example, there is a Joint Interim Standing Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections, which voted to draft the bill I am presenting today, Assembly Bill 443, also imposed new requirements, in particular those regarding membership, quorum, and legislative commission oversight for the Joint Interim Committees that differ from those of prior interim committees. The previous legislative interim was the first time the legislature was operating under the, these new interim structures, and as such, there were a few lessons learned and necessary changes identified to propose to improve the, the process. Assembly Bill 243 seeks to address a few oversights of AB 443 that were not discovered until the first interim of implementation and incorporates a few other changes to interim activities in general. Assembly Bill 243 is essentially a cleanup bill. As originally written, Assembly Bill 243 proposed several changes to the interim committee structure of the legislature, including clarifying the vacancy of a chair for a joint interim standing committee. The vice chair shall become acting chair until the chair is appointed clarifying that if a regular member of a joint interim standing committee cannot attend a meeting, the alternate member that attends in the member's place must be, to the extent practical, of the same political party. Transferring the duties to evaluate and review issues relating to governmental purchasing from the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Government Affairs. Similarly, AB 443 requires the Commission to study governmental purchasing, commonly known as the Nevada Public Purchasing Study Commission, to submit a report including recommendations for legislation relating to governmental purchasing. The Joint Interim Standing Committee on Government Affairs will be uh, conducting this, uh, this business. The original bill also repealed the requirement that the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services review regulations related to health care. Finally, AB 243, as written, revised the date that a teacher who wishes to serve on the Nevada State Teacher Recruitment and Retention Advisory Task Force must submit an application to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Education from January 15th of an even-numbered year to December 1st of an odd-numbered year. This would give the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Education the additional time it needs to appoint members of the task force by February 1st of each even-numbered year. The amendment. So as amended, AB 243 now includes several additional changes to the interim structure of the legislature. First, the bill requires certain reports to be submitted to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on, judici on, on Judiciary and transfer certain duties relating to industrial programs from the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Judiciary to the Interim Finance Committee. As amended, AB 243 also revises the meeting timelines for the Joint Interim Standing Committees. The bill requires the Legislative Commission to appoint members and alternate members of each Joint Interim Standing Committee by August 31st, uh, following each regular legislative session, and authorizes such committees to begin meeting on September 1st of that year. This will give committees greater flexibility in choosing meeting dates and provide for more time for committees to meet throughout the interim. Further, the bill makes a few procedural changes to the operations of the Joint Interim Standing Committees to require that only the chair of a Joint Interim Standing Committee may call a meeting of the committee. Any proposed recommend recommended legislation must be approved by a majority of the committee rather than a majority of Senate members and a majority of Assembly members serving on the committee, and that any legislator who is serving the final term of his or her current House is not eligible to serve as chair or vice chair of an interim committee. Section 1 of the bill transfers the duty to evaluate and review issues relating to child welfare from the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Judiciary so that the issues of child welfare and juvenile justice are evaluated and reviewed under a single committee. Assembly Bill 243 also repeals provisions relating to the creation, membership, and procedures of the Subcommittee on Public Lands of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources. The powers and duties of the subcommittee are transferred to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources. It is important to note that the scope and duties of the subcommittee are not removed from statute with this change. The Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources will still review and evaluate public lands issues 
public lands issues and the intent of the bill is not to eliminate the meetings in rural areas of our state that the subcommittee has traditionally held. Instead, the intent of the bill is to streamline the operations of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources and with this change, even more committee members will have the opportunity to evaluate and review public land issues as well as attend rural tours. Additionally, the bill aligns the membership requirements and procedures relating to the election of the chair and vice chair, vacancies, meetings, quorums, compensation, and expenses of the legislative committee for the review and oversight of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and the Marlette Lake Water System and the legislative committee on senior citizens, veterans, and adults with special needs with those of the various joint interim standing committees. Assembly Bill 243 renames the Sunset Subcommittee of the Legislative Commission as the Sunset Committee of the Legislature and makes the committee independent of the Legislative Commission. The bill ensures that the committee has the same membership requirements and procedures related to the election of the chair and vice chair, vacancies, meetings, quorums, compensation, and expenses as the various joint interim standing committees. With this change, the Sunset Committee will have more time to review boards and commissions and will be able to submit its own recommendations for legislation rather than submitting them to the Legislative Commission for approval. The bill also changes, makes changes to the provisions related to a Legislative Committee members and staff regulated by the Nevada Lobbying Disclosure and Regulations Act and the Nevada Financial Disclosure Act so that Legislative Committee staff members may attend tours that are organized for the committee. And finally, the bill revises the dates by which the State Board of Education must submit and the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Education must review a report relating to the instruction of the Holocaust and other genocides and removes the requirement for certain hospitals to submit a staffing committee report to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services and the director of the LCB, which according to the Nevada Hospital Association is, duplicative and is, a, is a duplicative effort to ensure compliance with staff committee, staffing committee laws. In summary, AB 243 proposes a handful of common sense changes to help improve the interim committee structure of the legislature. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn things over to uh, uh, Council uh, Powers uh, to see if he, if he may have any uh, further exp ex ex explanations of this uh, bill. Thank you, Assemblyman. Good afternoon, Mr. Powers. Thank you for being here. We understand you're nonpartisan staff, but I hope you, I appreciate you being here to walk us through the uh, amended version of this bill that came out of the Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Kevin Powers, General Counsel, Legislative Counsel Bureau Legal Division. And as you mentioned, we are nonpartisan staff. However, the LCB statutes that control the presentations made by nonpartisan staff do allow nonpartisan staff to make recommendations to the legislature when that legislation affects the operations of the Legislative Counsel Bureau or the legislative branch of government. So with regard to this leg legislation, I have a little more leeway to explain how this legislation will impact the Legislative Counsel Bureau and its operations. Um, the Assemblyman provided an excellent overview of all the uh, components of the bill, so I think at this stage I'll take any questions, and, and after that I think I want to do a little more presentation with regard to the legislative uh, committee meetings or events or trips, so I'm just going to open it to questions right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Members, questions? I see a question from Senator Krasner. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. I just had some questions on Section 9 of the bill. Um, let me see. In Section 9, it says that this bill authorizes the Joint Interim Standing Committee to begin holding their meetings on September 1. That's fine. Uh, it also says Section 9 provides that if a regular member cannot attend a meeting of the committee, an alternate member must, to the extent practicable, be of the same political party as the regular member. So it's allowing somebody from a different political party to serve there. Uh, it also says that uh, when acting in place of a regular member, the alternate member has all the powers, privileges, and immunities as a regular member. And then it further goes on in Section 9 that at least five members of the eight-member committee regardless of their house, um, can vote in favor of legislation. That's a little bit concerning. Um, could you address that, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, again, Kevin Powers, General Counsel. A couple questions in there. The way the joint interim committees are composed, they have eight regular members and five alternate members. What will happen with regard to the political party of the alternate members is if you have that political party member available to take over a regular member, then 
they will be of the same political party. But since you don't have an eight to eight ratio, there is a possibility that four of the other alternate members aren't available to fill a regular member seat and that last alternate member is not part of the same political party, but that alternate member can still serve because they're the last one standing less, uh, uh, more or less. That seems like a very unusual and likely event, but in drafting legislation, you have to try to cover every possible contingency. So because there's not eight alternate members to match eight regular members, you have to cover that possible contingency. With regard to the hard five, the number of members that have to approve recommended legislation, as we know, the way most interim committees work, including the joint interim standing committees, is you have your meeting where you vote on recommended legislation as the last meeting of the interim. And so it's highly unlikely that you wouldn't have your political party makeup as appointed on that last meeting because most legislators will be available for that important meeting where legislation is, recommended legislation is voted on. However, I do want to make clear under the existing statutes, you have to have a majority of the, of the assembly members vote for the recommended legis legislation and a majority of the Senate um, vote for the recommended legislation. This changes it to a hard five. Regardless of the number of members present at the meeting, you always have to have five members voting in favor of recommended legislation. Um, and so finally, with the um, last comment with the alternate members, the phrase that when acting in place of a regular member, an alternate member has all the powers, privilege, immunities of a regular member, that's a standard um, rule of parliamentary law, that if you replace a regular member, you're sitting in their place and you exercise their powers for that committee and you're also protected by any privileges and immunities that the regular member would otherwise have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And follow-up, Chair. And, and I please go I, ahead and members if you have follow ups please go ahead you, you don't need to ask thank you chair um, I guess that's just part of the concern that you know you, you never say never because things happen as we get busy in the building and in the interim as well um, if you know by some chance one of the regular members of a particular political party was not able to come and neither was the next alternate for whatever reason uh, you have a different member of a political party, and that is the day that someone deci the chair decides we're going to take a vote. Uh, that could really have a huge effect on the outcome of the vote. So that's just my concern there, since they have the same powers and privileges, and they could vote. They could alter the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, for the record, Kevin Powers. That is true in that scenario. It could be possible that the makeup of the committee moves to another makeup because you don't have all the alternates um, from one political party available. However, keep in mind these are interim committees. The most they can do is recommend legislation. Um, it's the entire legislative body during the session that actually passes legislation. So all they're doing is essentially approving bill draft requests. Thank you. And just one follow up. So um, is it all interim committees including uh, interim finance and the legislative commission? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Kevin Powers. No, it's just the joint interim standing committees and then three other committees, the Marlette Lake Tahoe Committee, the Senior Citizens, Veterans and Adult with Special Needs Committee, and the Sunset um, Commission. They're going to be governed by the hard five provision that doesn't distinguish between the houses. However, Legislative Commission, Interim Finance Committee, they have separate statutes. They'll still be governed by their existing statutes, and they won't be affected by this piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Members, additional questions? Yes. Senator uh, Sievers Gansford, then I've got Senator Daly. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just kind of wondering about the motivation from changing from each house voting like we do in the interim. Uh, when we do our joint meetings here, we always vote each house. We don't do a total unless, uh, no, I guess if we do finance, we separate them out. So, so this is changing really the way that some of the things operate from um, separate house votes to one vote. Thank you, Matt. Mr. Chair, for the record, Kevin Powers again. Um, that is true. It is changing the operation from somehow, somehow other interim committees, you know, have operated in the past. As for why the change is being made, that's beyond the leeway I get as nonpartisan staff, so I'm going to have to punt that to the assemblyman. Thank you. 
And uh, again, uh, f- full disclosure, I was not on the, uh, the interim. I'm a, I'm a freshman, and this was given to me about five minutes ago, as, as I said. So uh, I'm not particularly sure about, uh, about the, the reasoning why, uh, but I can uh, get back to you with the, uh, with the actual answer. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And if I could jump in, I, I was on that interim legislative committee, and I've been going through the minutes, and I'm actually trying to figure out if this was in our original recommendations or if this was in the assembly amendment. So that's something I need to check on, Senator Gansard. I think it came, this comes from the assembly amendment and was not part of our recommendation from the interim. Unfortunately, at that last, I was not present at the last, our last meeting during the interim. Um, but uh, any additional questions, Senator Ganser? Yes, no. Senator Daly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have the same concerns. I, I understand uh, the testimony and uh, what Mr. Powers said regarding how it's going to be changed. There's no requirement to change it that way. We can keep it the way we want, I'm assuming. Uh, it's a policy decision. Because um, I, I look at it the same way, I says, and when you read it, it did not change that for IFC. Um, it, you know, Legislative Commission is a whole different animal, it's six to six, uh, or six from each house. Um, but I was curious about where did it come from when I was trying to look at, uh, uh, the chair was, uh, kind enough to look up the interim committee paperwork and various things and that recommendation about the voting in each house was not in the recommendation that I can see and the term limits I'm not following why we would want to do that and then of course we exclude legislative commission but we don't do it for IFC and then all the other committee uh, structures and I don't know if you have the answer that's a policy uh, deal as well but uh, to me I'm I don't, I don't make that distinction on the term limits. The only time you would have an issue is if it goes past the election before you start, it's a couple months, uh, you would have to fill a vacancy. But. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record again, Kevin Powers. Uh, with regard to the term limits, you're referring to Section 2 of the bill, and Section 2 of the bill provides that when a legislator, after their final regular session, is blocked by term limits from running again in that House, they can't serve as a chair or vice chair of an interim committee. I believe the underlying intent of that is that they, the legislators who proposed this wanted to ensure that the chairs and vice chairs of interim committees would be around the next session to forward the um, policies and legislation that was recommended by those interim committees and they would also get experience serving as chairs or vice chairs during the interim committees and they would be available during the next regular session. When you're term limited, then you're not going to be around during the next legislative session. So you're essentially, and using a term that we all know exists, you're essentially a lame duck legislator who's overseeing a legislative committee and you won't be around during the next session. So I think the intent was to remove lame duck legislators from being chairs or vice chairs, but they can still serve on those interim committees. Thank you. And, and thank you for that, that explanation. And I understand we all know the lame duck uh, stuff. And, you know, with any luck, we'll all get there, right? You know, <laughs> um, the uh, I, I I don't know. It's a policy issue on me. I'm not sure that it's as valuable as somebody might think. Uh, people are still going to be there. Uh, they're still going to serve on the committee, especially on the Senate side. There's too few of us not to, right? <laughs> We're going to have to use everybody we got. Um, so anyway, yeah, no, it's just a, a uh, policy uh, concern uh, on that. Uh, I'm looking, I think that's all I had. Uh, oh, the last final thing, and I don't know if you know the thought process, maybe the assemblyman does on, why would you change it that only the chair can call the committee and rather than a majority of the committee? It seems to me that you always have that as a majority of the committee can call it as a safeguard to the chair just going AWOL and not doing their job. But if only the chair can call it, uh, I think that's a mistake, so that part, uh, I don't know if you got an explanation for that, but I don't think you're going to convince me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Kevin Powers. Let me say this about that change. Another change in this bill also says that all the joint interim standing committees and all other inner committees are subject to all applicable principles of parliamentary law. So one of the governing principles of parliamentary law is the chair is the presiding officer subject to the authority and power of a majority of the committee acting um, to override the chair. So even though it doesn't specifically provide in the statute that the committee 
um, can call a meeting over the authority of the chair. I believe as a general principle of parliamentary law, the committee could still call a meeting and override the chair if the chair, like you said, decided to go rogue and not call any meetings at all. Because once again, there's a common law principle that power abhors a vacuum or vacancy, and so a chair who went rogue and would not do their job could either be removed by the legislative commission who appoints the chair, or the, a majority of the committee could act to ensure that the committee could exercise its power. Thank you. And I understand that, and I got the part uh, that was on the common law and the various things and the uh, Mason's rules and all those things uh, stand, so they're part of the parliamentary procedure and how we structure ourselves and various things. Um, but it seems esoteric to, to kind of know that, and I know quite a bit about it, but you know, I wasn't thinking that way either. I'm thinking, well, the chair can call it, and that's what it says. Um, then have to go to another level on that. Of course, you could remove the chair, legislative commission. There, there's other people that have authority to make things happen. Uh, but it seems to me it's just easier and more clear if the language is there that, or the committee can do it, majority. Senator, uh, this is a Ruben De Silva for the record, and I'll, I'll take both of those questions back uh, and, uh, and, and provide a, a, an answer to the, uh, to the committee. Uh, one regarding the, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, we now have uh, a, a, a common vote, I believe it is, as opposed to a, a, a singular house vote, and then uh, the, uh, the actual chair being the individual now who, uh, who makes those decisions. So I'll give those answers back to you, Senator. That and the term limits. And term limits, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have a, a couple of questions. I think my first question, I believe for Mr. Powers, sections four to six, the codification of these existing common law principles and the statutory provisions that apply to interim committees, uh, how, if this, if this passes and is signed into law, how do you see that changing the function of the interim committees? Uh, do you think it'll be any change or is this more of a housekeeping measure? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think there will be any change because these principles apply already to these interim committees, so I believe this is a housekeeping measure. But to follow up on what Senator Daly just pointed out, the average reader of the statutes are not familiar with common law principles of parliamentary law. Most attorneys aren't com familiar with common law principles of parliamentary law. Believe me, I discuss, it with <laughs> discuss these principles with many people and they just give me blank stares. But it's important for the reader of the statutes to understand that all proceedings of the committees are going to be subject to the statutes and those provisions of, you know, parliamentary law that enhance and supplement those statutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And then um, the proposal to delete the subcommittee on public lands from the interim committee on natural resources. Are there any other interim committees under our revised structure since last session? that have subcommittees in statute, or is this the only one, and would this be striking the only statutorily created subcommittee of one of our interim legislative committees? It is my understanding that the subcommittee on public lands is the last remaining subcommittee of one of the joint interim standing committees. When the legislature last session created the joint interim standing committees, they eliminated many of the existing subcommittees that had dealt with specific areas of the law with the presumption that the joint interim standing committees would then take care of those areas of the law, investigate, recommend legislation. So what this bill does is remove the last of those subcommittees, the subcommittees on public land, but transfers those powers and duties to the joint Interim Standard Committee on Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And then if I could ask one last question, and this has to do with Section 1. In terms of the revisions on the bill draft requests that uh, some of the interim committees are getting, I'm trying to make sure I understand here, but um, in terms of interim committee on natural resources, I see that language uh, being uh, struck out of the statute. So those 14 legislative measures are just going away? Or Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Kevin Powers. Uh, what's happening now is that 
the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources will have the 10 legislative measures allotted in subsection 3A to any Joint Interim Standing Committee. And then also the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services, they will have the 10 legislative measures allotted to that committee. So that of the Joint Interim Standing Committees, the only one that has additional measure, measures is Judiciary, which will have five additional members for child welf welfare and five additional legislative measures relating to juvenile justice. So all Joint Interim Standing Committees will have the basic 10 allotment of legislative measures. Only Judiciary will have those extras dealing with child uh, welfare and juvenile justice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And so then one brief follow-up then. The revisions in Section 1, will it be a net gain for these interim committees of build draft requests or a net loss in terms of their... I think the gain or loss will be small because you're taking some away from natural resources and health and human services, but you're essentially giving those to judiciary. So it'll be essentially a wash, but I can't say without doing the actual math right here what it'll be, but the difference could not be more than one or two. Okay, thank you. I thank appreciate you, that. Chair. Okay, members, any additional questions for Assemblyman De Silva or Mr. Powers? All right, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Thank you both for presenting the bill today. With that, we will go to support for Assembly Bill 243. We will start here in Carson City. Anyone who's in support who wishes to be heard? I'm not seeing anyone. And I don't see anyone at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting, do we have anyone on the phone lines in support of Assembly Bill 243? Test five support of AB 243, press star nine to take your place in the queue. Are there are no call solutions to test five support at this time. Thank you. I'd like to go to opposition to Assembly Bill 243. Anyone who's opposed to the measure who wishes to be heard here in Carson City? Don't see anyone at the Sawyer Building. Broadcasting anyone on the phone lines who wishes to speak in opposition? To testify in opposition to AB 243, press star nine to take your place in the queue. If there are no calls wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. Now neutral. I'd like to go to neutral. Anyone who wishes to give neutral testimony in the measure here in Carson City? Down at the Sawyer Building? I don't see anyone down there. And I don't see anyone here in Carson City broadcasting anyone on the phone lines. That's by neutral to AB 243. Press star nine to take your place in the queue. There are no calls wishing to testify neutral at this time. Thank you very much. Assemblyman De Silva, any closing comments? No? All right. Well, thank you very much, Assemblyman. Thank you, Mr. Powers. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 243. And uh, we have uh, one item on left. I believe that's public comment. So anyone who wishes to make public comment here in Carson City or down at the Sawyer Building? I don't see anyone at the Sawyer Building. No one's coming up here in Carson City. Broadcasting anyone on the phone lines who wishes to make public comment. And we are limiting public comment to two minutes per caller. If you would like to provide public comment, press star nine to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. However, there are no calls wishing to provide public comment at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. With that, members, I will uh, we'll go into recess, and uh, I'm not sure if we're going to come back and have you know any any other action. If not, I'll just come in and gavel us closed. There won't be need for everybody to to uh, come back. But we are in recess.
Good evening, everyone. I want to call the meeting of the Senate Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections back to order. Please enter your host key followed by pound. We were in a brief recess and uh, we are back to order and we are adjourned. <laughs>